So just like torque was the angular equivalent of force, angular momentum is going to be the angular equivalent of regular momentum. So if we remember back to momentum a few weeks ago, momentum was P and that was M times V. So angular momentum, which is the, we represent with the capital letter L. Is going to equal the angular equivalent of mass, which is moment of inertia. And then the angular equivalent of velocity is angular velocity. And so this is one equation for angular momentum. Then if you remember to last week when we were talking about torque, so we saw same kind of thing. So torque was the analog for force. So we saw force was MA. So torque is I times alpha. But then we saw another definition for torque where it was the R cross the linear term. So we're gonna have the same thing for angular momentum. So angular momentum will be R cross the linear momentum term. And so if we look at the units for angular momentum, if we look at this first equation, we have units of moment of inertia, which is, yep. Oh, right, yeah, so this is a cross product again. which was a special type of multiplication that we'll do a special session on, not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Um, but for right now, you just need to know that it becomes magnitude of R, magnitude of P, times sine of the angle between them. And that will give you the magnitude of the angular momentum. So if we look at the units for this first thing, uh, typical units for moment of inertia are kilogram times meters squared. And the unit for Angular velocity is either radian per second or one over second. And so the units for angular momentum are kilogram meters squared per second. And if we look at the units for the bottom equation, we'll get the same thing. So 
the units for radius are meters, the units for momentum are kilogram meter per second. So you get that the units for angular momentum again are kilogram meters squared per second. And so we will look at the applications of these equations in a second, but I wanna show another relationship between all of these things that we've learned. So again, we'll think back to our linear motion and we saw that force equals change in momentum over change in time. And so if torque is the angular equivalent for force, then we should have the same kind of relationship for angular momentum and torque. So if you, you really only need to learn the linear relationships and then you can just replace all of the linear terms with angular terms and all of your equations still look good. So now we've got three, we have two equations for angular momentum. And then we've got one equation that ties angular momentum to torque. And we remember that torque also had two equations that we could write down for it. Okay, so then sticking back or going back to thinking about linear motion, with regular momentum, we saw we had a conservation law. And so we're also going to have a conservation law for angular momentum. So whatever initial angular momentum you start with would be the angular momentum you finish with if there are no external torques. Might be a lot of equations, but they're all similar to what we've already done in linear momentum. Okay, so we'll start with a, a common thing that you'll see. So we have these two relationships for angular momentum. And so a lot of questions will give you three of these things and ask you to find the fourth. So just like with torque, where we set the two torques equal to each other, if we do that here, then we get R cross P equals I omega. Okay. 
So let's say that you are spinning a rock with a string over your head and the rock did a traveled in a circular path like this. And I told you the radius of this. Circle was R. And the mass is. Zero point five mass is two kilograms. <clears throat> and now for this, there's a few other equations that we can remember. So omega is Velocity over R. That would make momentum equal to M omega R. So what I've done here is I've taken this equation and solved it for V. And then I've plugged that in to this V. So now you would have R M omega R sine theta equals I omega. So we could say that the angular velocity was let's see. Maybe it's really fast. Maybe it's two pi radians per second, which is just one rotation every second. And so if the angle between these two things is 90, then the sine of 90 is one. And this would just be m omega r squared equals i omega. Your omegas would cancel. You get i equals m r squared. And so this is the kind of the base definition for moment of inertia. So this is moment of inertia of a mass moving a distance r away from the axis of rotation. And so what 
what we were doing in this picture was we were taking a point mass and making it do some kind of circular motion. And this moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of any point mass that moves in a circle, basically. So in calculus, what you'll do is you start with this kind of equation for a small part of whatever thing is spinning or rotating. And then you do integrals on that small thing over the shape of your object to get the more complex moment of inertia is like we saw for a solid ball, solid sphere. It was two fifths mr squared. And so if you do the kind of thing that I was talking about in calculus, then you can derive this moment of inertia for a solid sphere starting with this equation. So you guys don't need to do that or know what that even means, but like there, and there's these, uh, there's a list of these moment of inertias in your textbook. And so that's where they all come from. If you start from this boxed equation and you do calculus, then you can derive all of those things. So any questions about this? So uh, like the point of this was that we were given this radius and the mass and the angular velocity. And from that, we were able to get the moment of inertia. So if you're given three things, then you can find the fourth thing. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, this is says two fifths. Okay. So that's an example of using the two different moments of, or the two different angular momentums, putting them together and then using that to solve for one of the variables in those equations. So now we'll look at an example of conservation of angular momentum. And this is an important conceptually and it has some easy Example, so if you think about the Winter Olympics and you think about ice skating, you have your ice skater and they've got their arms out and they'll be spinning at some angular velocity omega. So this is the initial picture. And then in the final picture, they'll bring their arms close into their body. And what usually happens when they do that? Yeah, they start spinning faster. So why, why does doing this make you go faster, right? Like they haven't, they haven't like pushed off the ground or anything. They haven't like, they're not like moving their arms fast to make themselves go or something. So how does that work? So that works from conservation of angular momentum. So angular momentum initial has to equal angular momentum final. So initially they had some moment of inertia I, and they had some angular velocity. 
And then in the final picture, they have some final moment of inertia and some final angular velocity. So from our intuition or what we've seen on TV, we know that omega final was bigger than omega initial. So what does that say about our moment of inertia? So is the final moment of inertia bigger or smaller than the initial angular or initial moment of inertia? Which one's bigger? So, right, so the initial has to be bigger because if the, if the initial or the final angular velocity went up, then the final, oh, maybe I'll try it. The initial or the final moment of inertia had to go down. So you, if you had all of the numbers, you could have calculated this was, I don't know, 10 whatever units. So if the angular velocity went up, then you would need to multiply by a smaller number to get the same numerical value, right? So maybe we can do some examples or plug in some numbers as an example. So let's say, uh, let's use that uh, kind of basic equation for moment of inertia, but this is not necessarily the moment of inertia of a person with their arms out, but we'll just use it as an approximation. So the mass of the person we'll say is 50 kilograms. And when they have their arms spread out, we'll say the radius is one meter. And then when they pull their arms in, we'll say that the radius is half a meter. And the initial rotational speed, we'll say two pi radians per second. So if we wanted to know their final angular velocity, we've got m r initial squared times two pi or oops, omega initial plus m r final squared times omega final. So you'll see the mass of the person doesn't matter. Solving for omega final, we would get r initial squared divided by r final squared times omega initial. So one squared divided by 0 0.25 squared times two pi. B 16 pi. I can do math in my head. Uh, Or this is so it would be thirty two pi radians per second, which is probably a lot faster than 
they would be spinning. The goal of this was to just plug in some numbers and see that indeed uh, the omega final that you get is bigger than the omega initial. And they accomplished that by decreasing their moment of inertia by bringing their arms in smaller, which made this radius smaller. So any questions about that? Okay, so we'll look at another example of conservation of angular momentum. And we'll go back to our astronomy example. So, so far we've only talked about things orbiting either the earth or the sun in circular motion, but there are other ways that you can orbit. So, if we have the sun over here and we have something like a comet, Then if we look at a representation of this in vector form, then we remember that when things are orbiting, their velocity is always pointing tangential to the circle. So these arrows are what tangential means. And then of course your R radius is going to be changing as well. But now, so there, there is a force acting on this comet that's making it orbit the sun, but there's no external torque acting on the comet. No external torque. And so if there's no external torque, we know that there's conservation of angular momentum. And so before I write down the equation, conceptually, what, what do you think is faster? Is the comet moving faster when it's further away from the sun or faster when it's closer to the sun? Closer or farther? Some people farther, some people closer. Okay, so let's determine. So if we look at our equation for angular momentum, we could write R cross P. Yes. Right. So its velocity is always tangential to the path of its orbit. So if we did circular motion, uh, so this is the radial direction, right? 
if you draw something from the center to the edge of the circle, that's radial. Then tangential means basically perpendicular to that. Now, when we do things that are not circles, this is an ellipse. Now your tangential isn't necessarily perpendicular to your ra orbital radius, but it still points along, a, like if I, um, like if you wanted to draw, a, if you picked a point here, and you wanted to draw a straight line out from it that would sit like flat on that point of the circle, that's what tangent means. So that's what I've done with all of these arrows is I've drawn the tangent uh, direction and that's where the velocity will point. So, our, so let's say we compare this as our initial position and this as our final position. So if the, so whatever we calculated initially is some value here. So now if our orbital radius is smaller, then what does our momentum and therefore velocity need to be to compensate for that? Bigger, right? So that's the, like conceptually, that's what we do with this conservation of angular momentum. We know that whatever angular momentum we had to start with, if we calculated it, it would be some number. Now, because angular momentum is conserved, if one of those numbers decreases or increases, the other one has to do the opposite to compensate for that. So again, if we just picked random numbers, if this initial momentum was 10, because this was, oh, that's not nice let's say eight, because this was four and two, then if your radius goes down to two, then your momentum has to go up to four so that it still equals eight, whatever units, right? So does that make sense? So any questions about how you do conservation of angular momentum? Yeah. Right, so these were just random made up numbers, but if the radius was four initially and the momentum was two initially, then we would calculate eight. Then if in the second picture, we measured our radius and it's smaller, so now it's only two, in order for conservation of momentum to be true, the right-hand side also has to multiply to be eight. So because we know two and we need to get eight, that makes the momentum, oh, these should be fine. That makes the final momentum have to be four so that it still multiplies together to be eight. Or if we do it with math, the right side is eight, and this is two times P final, then we would divide eight over two to get the value for P final. And it's a little bit more complicated than that because these are cross products and we haven't really taken into account the angle between the vectors, but um, that's not, very necessary when you're just thinking about it conceptually. 
So there's another concept that I wanted to talk about that's related to circular motion. Um, and that is centrifugal. Oh, I guess that's not what's in. So centrifugal force. And so I say that this is a force in quotation marks because it's not a force. It's, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So kind of the classical example of this would be So you're driving in a car and here's where you start and here's where you want to end. And somewhere in the middle here, you feel some force. How do I draw this from the top? I guess you're sitting here driving. So you feel or think you feel some force that's pushing you towards the outside of this path, right? So if you're sitting in a car and you go around a curve, you kind of feel like you're being pushed out towards the outside of the turn that you're making. So, this is called the centrifugal force, but it's not really a force. So what's happening is that as you are going through this turn, your velocity is pointing in this direction, right? So this is velocity. Now, as the car turns, you haven't turned, right? The car has started to turn, but you are not in contact with the ground like the car is through its tires. So you turn the tires of the car, that makes the car start going this way, but you keep going in the same direction that you were going, right? So your body wants to keep going in this direction, but the car is now not going in that direction anymore. So that's the force that you feel. So this is really a consequence of inertia. So remember inertia was that a body at rest, stays at rest, and a body in motion stays in motion until acted on by an external force. So the external force acting on the car that's making it turn is the fact that its tires are in contact with the ground and there's friction that will make, once you turn the tires, that'll make the car go in the direction that you turn the tires. But because you don't have a friction force with the ground, you don't feel that same turning force. So you feel like you wanna keep going in a straight line until your seatbelt or whatever makes you start going in this circular path. So centrifugal force is a consequence of inertia that you experience when you have things that are moving in circular motion. And if you take more advanced physics, uh, another way of saying that is that it's a force that comes about when you have a rotating reference frame. Um, so another, so 
When I say this isn't a real force, you'll sometimes see this called a fictitious force. And the reason for that is because there's not a, like there's not a gravitational force, there's not a friction force, there's not a spring force. None of those forces that we know and have studied are responsible for this centrifugal force. And it's only a consequence of inertia and the fact that you're in a, a reference frame that's rotating. And then this instance, that reference frame is the car. So there's not, at least for right now, there's not necessarily anything to calculate for this. It's just the concept that you need to understand. <clears throat> 